never had that walk on before. But then again, I've never spoken at the Dolby Theater. Uh, it's great to be here. It's great to chat with you all about television, video, the future. But I, I want to address probably the one question that's on all of your minds right now. And that is, why are you listening to an investment banker? If you uh, were to Google us, we don't exactly have the best reputations. So regardless of what you think of your day job, every morning I wake up knowing this is what people think of us. Uh, but we try to do things um, uh, differently, and it's important to be different because, quite frankly, you really do have to unlearn some of the things they teach you on Wall Street. I remember my first day at Solomon Brothers now many moons ago. They taught us something they called the, the red suit rule. And, and the red suit rule um, stood for the proposition, there we go, that, that if the client wants a red suit, sell them a red suit. And of course, at Luma, we think this is a terrible idea. It leads to bad transactions. After all, there's not that many people that look good uh, in a red suit. Comedy is all about timing. Um, some exceptions, of course. Some except We're going to see this later. This is my last slide, actually. We're just going to leave this up. Uh, no, seriously. Um, so it turns out, uh, you know, talking about this world of where media meets technology and the convergence of TV is something that kind of I've been trained for uh, for for some period of time, uh, because the first half of my career was really advising companies in TV or wanted to get into TV. Some of the some of the telcos. The second half was really in all about you know advising companies in the digital realm, and I'm pretty certain that the third half of my career is going to be at, at the uh, convergence of the of the two. Now. It's kind of important to get the timing right on this because 16 years ago, I announced a little transaction that I worked on um, that was kind of at, at this uh, intersection clearly too early, right? I mean, I know what you're thinking. Why is an investment banker mentioning the worst M&A deal in history where there was a legal but inappropriate shift of $55 billion from one shareholder group to another? Um, well, that's a good question. Um, I advise AOL. Well. So um, they, they were the ones on the receiving end of that. They're still uh, fat, dumb, and happy. And, and really, what's interesting is not only was that you know, misappropriate on valuations, but it was probably 20 years too early, which is to say we're probably four years away from massive media companies you know, uh, um, you know, potentially combining with, with digital uh, giants. I still think we're not quite there. But I want to talk about uh, where we are. Um, and we've, we've put out a couple decks talking about video, talking about TV over the last couple of years have been widely distributed. They're all available on our website if you want to check them out. I'm just going to touch on some of the, some of the high points um, here, uh, here today. You're all aware of the massive proliferation of devices and the consequential consumer uh, you know, embrace of, of video. I mean, it's been uh, exponential growth in terms of, of views. And there's one company um, that um, obviously was playing a, a lead role in that, and that's uh, YouTube. But now, obviously, it's not the only game in town. There are other scaled mass audience platforms that are developing distribution opportunities for creators of uh, video. We think this is a good thing. The democratization of digital video is very uh, healthy for the ecosystem. And some of these new players, are, and, and in particular, like, you know, just, just look at Facebook, still hasn't sort of really cranked up the monetization side of video, but just in terms of views, already matching YouTube at over uh, 8 billion uh, daily views, 75% of which is mobile. So we are moving to a mobile video world, that is clear. Um, and, you know, now there are apps that even tackle that very difficult thing called live, right, where you can now... Uh, broadcast uh, live events on your on your mobile phone. These have had you know massive adoption, and I believe it was just early days in terms of both the application and the implications of that kind of video distribution. Because think about it, right? Live TV was the one sort of stalwart that traditional folks with the rights and with the exclusivity and the walled gardens around those events could could uh, could monetize, and now it's fairly distributed. And the other thing, of course, is, as evidenced by what Snapchat's doing with some of their ad formats, is clearly we're moving to this vertical uh, format. Uh, we'll see how that uh, develops. But these are sort of new things in the, in the whole digital video world. So it's no wonder that every publisher and their brother and sister 
is, is, is adopting video. You know, if you are selling web pages, uh, why not uh, sell video? The consumers want it. You, you, it's more scarce inventory, and you can uh, yield more. In fact, if you compare it to display, which has had this sort of race to the bottom, right, in terms of yield, uh, video looks so much better, and it's more compelling, and it's more engaging, and the brand marketers uh, love it. So it's no wonder that we've seen, you know, near 30% growth in the digital video market, now over our, uh, about $7.5 billion on its way to 10 this year. Hey, isn't that great? Growing at a rapid pace, the automated uh, aspect of it, the programmatic stuff growing even faster. Woohoo! isn't this great? But it's nothing compared to television, which is why I call this the future of TV. I think the two um, converge. Uh, you put that in scale with the current TV spend in this country, and it's dwarfed in comparison. And by the way, TV is still growing, oddly. Um, but we're going to talk about some of, those, some of those things. In fact, this future of TV presentation we did sort of went into great depths talking about the economics of TV and why, while change is coming, for sure, it may not come kind of the way some of the digital uh, folks think about it. In fact, we talked about the two worlds of traditional and digital and how they have very, very different thoughts, uh, 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 approaches as to what they think the future looks like. The traditional folks, up until about two years ago, kind of had their head in the sand, right? TV was good, they're making tons of money, why bother? Uh, you know, stop annoying me, Terry, with all this talk about uh, digital because it's, you know, peanuts compared to my vibrant and highly profitable uh, TV business. Well, that's clearly not right. Uh, uh, and by the way, neither were the digital guys. There was a lot of digital players that said, oh yeah, we're going to crush these dumb old TV guys uh, just like we did newspapers and just like we did music. No, you're not. TV is different. And you have to understand the constructs of the industry to understand how you have to take a different approach to this convergent TV opportunity. Yes, 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 change is coming. But I think you got to understand how TV works in order to uh, take, uh, take full advantage of it. Even the motivations are different, right? The traditional guys are worried about losing uh, their uh, huge market caps, and the digital folks um, and, and their investors are all looking at this huge you know, revenue um, opportunity. In fact, if you compare these two worlds, the TV world and the digital video world, just on the, like the Lumascapes, they're vastly different, right? Their the TV world is, is much fewer players. There's uh, uh, half the categories, a quarter of the companies. And then when you factor in the spend, it's like a hundred to one uh, ratio between the two. So that might let you conclude that, well, maybe these digital video upstarts are not necessarily going to be the companies that are going to change this vast industry. And that could be well true, but I'll tell you what, these companies are massive uh, uh, market caps, over $2 trillion with, with more cash than the entire TV industry to put to work with the prioritization of being a major player in this convergent TV world. So change she be a common, that's for sure. Um, and, and interestingly, you know, it wasn't only you know, seven or eight years ago when we had very, very different worlds, right? TV content was on TV devices. Digital content was on digital devices. Now, with the crossovers, the partnerships on content, TV everywhere, uh, and OTT, we now basically have it's all you know, put together in a, in a, in a soup, um, such that all devices in, are used at the same time. And uh, uh, we've seen you know, partnerships in terms of distribution. The one change we may see coming to uh, distribution are a couple of players who are putting serious money into the notion of competing with the traditional uh, uh, distribution uh, uh, players. So we'll see how those pan out, in particular in, uh, in emerging uh, markets. So clearly, what happened to TV uh, was a massive fragmentation of their audiences. It wasn't only 20 years ago that a hit show or a top, uh, um, uh, you know, talk show or sitcom would attract mass audience that today, you know, dwindles in, in significance. What was the television industry's answer to mass audience fragmentation? Raise prices. All they did was raise prices. TV costs more. You know this because you end up paying your cable bundle today than it did before, and yet it delivers a smaller audience. And as a result, the 
marginal GRP, reaching that marginal audience has gotten so much more expensive for people who want to advertise to large uh, groups of audiences. And remember, they're still using this crude targeting mechanism known as demographics and age. Um, so, so clearly, that's the opportunity for, for digital. And again, until the upfronts in 2014, most of TV was kind of uh, don't really, not really bothering me. That was a weak upfront. And then this year, or sorry, last year's upfront in 2015 was actually down. So theoretically, it was a downfront. Um, but, and, and, and that was the first time that the cracks in the wall really sort of uh, became pretty significant. And let me tell you something. That caught TV's attention. They were like, oh my God, for the first time in you know, 60 uh, or plus years. And what was interesting that uh, was to look at how uh, both these camps, the digital camp and the traditional camp, were selling their shows in this upfront, which is the May-June time frame when they sort of sell about 70% of their advertising for the year. Normally, the traditional guys sell on the basis of their content. They, they bring out the stars, they talk about their amazing shows, and they say, yeah, isn't this going to be great? We're going to have an awesome audience. Please buy our advertising. Whereas, you know, in the new fronts, which is the digital version of the upfront, these digital video companies all talk about data. You know, we can target your audiences, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what we found was in 2015, these selling propositions were reversed. It was the traditional folks like NBC who talked about data. They talked about how um, you could use, you, know, you could do high uh, level targeting um, at NBC for a Chobani ad. On the flip side, the digital folks, what were they talking about? They were talking about original content. So we had complete role uh, reversal in terms of how these people were selling their value uh, propositions. So, uh, so now we have much more of a converged world. Think of the future of being, hey man, it's all content across all devices. Um, so it's a much more unified world, and particularly with the migration to OTT. We've seen the bundle start to weaken, although you know, uh, uh, Comcast, uh, I think today or yesterday, um, said they had their greatest uh, fourth quarter uh, ad, uh, sub ad in, uh, since 2006. But, but we've we, we definitely seen a migration where people are opting for these uh, mini, uh, mini bundles. People, I think, are largely getting what they want um, without uh, necessarily having to take that full uh, monthly package. And by the way, this has affected their stock prices, right? We saw it was like the summer of gloom, and it's only gotten worse, uh, where, where people are really questioning the viability of that traditional TV model as digital uh, takes, uh, takes further hold. Now, some would have you believe that there is this uh, dichotomy out there that either you go from linear TV to sort of you know, programmatic TV. That is clearly not going to be um, the case. So we think there are many node points um, along the way, and it's probably a, a, a linear progression where there's going to be opportunities across that spectrum. And, and companies, I think, that talk you know, digital well, we'll just, we'll just do an RTB, a real-time bidded you know, television uh, uh, marketplace. Well, that is not going to happen, folks. I mean, the folks in TV that operate this cabal and have this sort of, you know, uh, nice scarcity value of their content are certainly not going to put their good stuff into an auction and watch it get eviscerated in terms of yield like what happened in display. So they're a little bit smarter than that. So what we tell people is don't, you know, don't focus only on those kind of display-like mechanics make sure that you're capturing the, uh, the broader opportunity. And in order to do that, you have to come to the market with capabilities that look different than just you know, an auction uh, marketplace. For all the major players, you have to have things like yield management and forecasting. And there's, in other words, yes, it's going to be digital technology, but it has to work for the expectations of the key players in the, in the linear world. In fact, we see a convergence of these two worlds where, yeah, traditional TV will bring all kinds of wonderful things to digital, but really the future is the digital guys bringing all this targeting and programmatic and analytics and the, really the ability for advertisers to pick and choose what they, what they want. But ultimately, we think this um, converges uh, with integrated workflow and, and, and basically a coalition, coalition of, of, of all these capabilities. And fortunately for people who do what I do, this largely happens through, uh, through M&A, right? Because the traditional guys don't have these capabilities. And so, you know, just in the last two years, we've seen 33 transactions in this sector 
uh, uh, and not to mention Maker, uh, which is, you know, funding why we're here uh, today. Way to go, Mark. And, and we've seen this across categories, content, distribution, monetization, and I will tell you, because it's a work in progress, uh, we're going to see a lot more, uh, in particular this year and in, even into next year, as the big guys all sort of suit up. Uh, here's just a sampling of some of the biggest companies with probably both offensive and defensive reasons to be active here. They got the most to lose and the most to gain. Uh, so I think we're going to continue to see um, activity here. And, and by the way, that's just a symptomatic of activity we're seeing uh, across a whole wider pool of potential strategic buyers in the sort of, you know, digital ad and marketing technology space as they see um, opportunities, which is, again, uh, great. What could be the potential game changers? Well, regulation. I mean, the FCC has a, uh, a new a proposal out called All Bid. That could be a complete game changer. And in fact, Rich Greenfield would tell you that we have never seen a more volatile potential uh, um, um, as, a, as it relates to regulation and how that affects TV. So this presidential election could be the biggest thing that ever happened to TV. Of course, technology, right? Different user um, interfaces could, uh, could change the game, um, like Apple TV or something of that nature. And then uh, finally, uh, content. Someone like an Amazon, like a Google, could license you know, NFL content or something like that. And I think that would be a major catalyst or, or, or a game changer. So w whatever happens, you know, there's going to be, we're going to continue to have this mass fragmentation. We put out these you know, Lumascapes that map all the companies in the digital sectors. And there's now 11 of these. And there's like going to be 15 soon. Someone suggested to us that we could have like a new motto, because we give, of course, these away for free. And they said, yeah, Luma Partners, confusion is free. Clarity has a price. Maybe we'll adopt that, but, but, but whatever. Uh, the good news is uh, we do think that in this video opportunity, in particular here for LA, there is going to be a lot of activity. In fact, we've been uh, fortunate enough to be involved with a number of deals here in LA, which is like a, such a phenomenal uh, technology market. We're uh, delighted to uh, spend time here uh, with uh, such great companies. With that, I thank you.